Hello everyone. We are presenting on the University of Sydney Library's new website, focusing on how we delivered a user-centric and integrated library digital presence. This is presented by me, Jen Stanton, who is the product owner for the project, Ben Griffith, the experience design specialist, and Maddie Wilson, the project manager. Before we start, I will acknowledge that the University of Sydney Libraries are on the lands of the Gadigal and the Darug people. This land was never ceded and I pay my respects to Elders past and present who continue to care for land, water and culture. The Library Digital Presence Project is a multi-year project to deliver a new website and the ongoing governance for the website. The website was delivered in January 2024 and the governance process and training for the website is being delivered at the time of recording in April 2024. This presentation will focus on the user experience design process for the website and some aspects of the website build and the content redevelopment. It will also briefly outline the new resources by subject pages, which have been delivered in place of the long-standing subject guides. I'll hand over to Ben to get started on the user experience design. User experience design was an essential part of this project because the information can only help our clients if it is found and understood. In terms of user research, some of our key tools and learnings were metrics. So we used our Google Analytics to review about 12 months worth of traffic. Uh, we found that we get about a million hits per semester on our homepage and about 50% of those are people going straight to the search box to search our library catalog. So we built the homepage design around that learning. Um, so we also collected some baseline feedback. We had a widget embedded in all the key pages on the old website uh, for a period of months. And they were basically emojis that users could, users could click to indicate their sentiment about a page, whether they liked it or not. And if they responded, it would prompt them for to provide some more information. And we got about 4,600 responses to that, which was fantastic. Uh, a lot of good qualitative and quantitative data uh, through that exercise. So one of our learnings was around our A to Z databases list. We found about half, it's our second most popular page after the, the homepage. We found about half of users were looking for a known database so they could potentially be searching rather than scrolling through a list. And about half of users were browsing by subject. So we built our new browse section around that, <clears throat> that use case. We also ran business requirements workshops with staff who were users of the website as well as stakeholders in it. Uh, and we did interviews with clients, which was useful for identifying pain points and opportunities for improvement. Another significant component of our process was led by the library's Indigenous Engagement Officer and focused on a visible and meaningful First Nations digital presence within the new site. First Nations refers to Indigenous Australians, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who are native to the lands upon which the University of Sydney resides. The initiative involved extensive consultation with 41 participants, 96% being Indigenous staff and students. We're really happy with the outcomes of this consultation, which can be seen across many areas of the new website. In terms of UX design, some of the tools we used for our research and testing of designs, uh, we did an environmental scan. So we looked at websites, not just library and university websites, but any websites that had excellent UX, we looked at what we could take and learn from. Uh, we did a heuristic review, so we had a set of criteria that we were evaluating our old site against. We went through page by page um, and UX testing. So we ran where we could uh, sessions one-on-one -on -one via Zoom and we recruited up to five people for per design we wanted to evaluate. We'd give them, get them to talk through the page, the mock-up of the page and tell us what they thought everything meant uh, and gave them an example task and got them to tell us how they would try and achieve that task using the prototype. Uh, and a lot of great insights came out of that as well. In terms of tools for UX design, initially we were using Adobe XD. We ended up transitioning to Figma to align with the organization, and that was a good move for us. Uh, we created a style guide with input from the branding team and a component library so that we could make changes to the components and they would update on all the mockups, which was extremely useful. Uh, we also created a click-through prototype of the whole site once we had enough pages page designs completed, and that really helped stakeholders, particular con particularly content authors, to get a sense of how the website would look and how it would hang together, how it would feel. And that was incredibly useful for a lot of our stakeholders. In terms of our UX design process, by the end, we kind of had figured this out. 
Um, once we had all our research done, we would create a design based on the research and requirements. Um, then we'd seek feedback on the technical side to make sure what we designed was feasible and also from the product owner to make sure it was fit for purpose to identify any issues with the suitability from the business side. Uh, we'd be scheduling uh, UX testing if we were able to as well. So then we would create responsive variants of the page once we'd incorporated feedback from that last step. Um, so we'd create mockups for each of our key screen sizes, each of our breakpoints. Um, if there were workflows within the page, then we'd mock those up interactively. Uh, this is usually where we would run those Zoom UX testing sessions. Uh, we would then do a consultation with key stakeholders. So we'd be trying to get uh, approval from senior stakeholders and um, also any final input from the UX testing. We would incorporate that at this stage. And then once everything was sort of signed off uh, or endorsed, uh, we would share it with the build team. And that wasn't throwing it over the fence. That was, we would sit with them, we'd go through it, we'd talk about how it could be built. Uh, and then during build, we were available to the development team uh, for clarifications or um, to discuss any issues with us and we could adapt the designs if needed. In terms of information architecture, um, a couple of approaches that we used, we did an environmental scan here as well. So we looked at six different library websites from around the world to analyze the structure that they had, see what seemed to work well, what didn't work so well, and that informed how we ended up proposing our own structure. Once we had proposed a structure, we did have uh, re refinement workshops with 44 staff to get their feedback on the proposed structure because uh, they had a good sense of what needed to be included and whether things were consistent based on their understanding of what we do. Just a bit more on information architecture. Once we had our structure drafted out, we did some external IA testing using a tool called Optimal Workshop. We've got about 150 responses across stakeholder groups um, with the help of some uh, coffee and meal vouchers. Um, we were asking our participants, um, we'd give them a page description and say, what would be a good name for this? We'd give them names and say, what do you think would be on a page called this? Uh, and we also gave them a collapsed tree view of our proposed structure and gave them a goal and asked them to explore the structure and choose the page where they would expect to find what they needed. Uh, and again, some very, very helpful insights there around the structure that helped us refine it. <clears throat> so lastly, governance um, for the information architecture, it is difficult to maintain consistency and cohesion. So we were iterating on the structure as we were getting this feedback, but we still needed to keep it coherent, make sure we weren't adding something in that existed in a different part already. Keeping that cohesive, coherent vision was essential for making sure we didn't fall back into the kind of sprawl that we had on the old website. Um, and that's a challenge ongoing, not just during that development, but also in business as usual, as updates are happening, we need to make sure that the structure stays consistent and that depends on having our decision makers with a consistent understanding of the website structure conceptually. The new website is built on Adobe Experience Manager using the Svelte framework. The focus for the build was sustainability, flexibility and to integrate where possible and I will showcase some of this for you today. One outcome of the new website was connecting to Alma so that the library can have a single source of truth for library databases. In doing this, when a record is added or changed in Alma, the metadata is exported from Alma to a JSON file that sits in an S3 cloud bucket. The JSON includes the record ID, the title, any variant titles, a description, subject headings, a URL for accessing the database, a URL for a help guide if available, and the metadata will also indicate if there is an outage or if registration is required for the database. The JSON file is then used by three different components throughout the website. The first on the slide is SuperSearch. Ben mentioned that our research showed that the search box is used for 50% of all visits to the website and that about half of all visitors to our full A to Z databases page know the name of the database that they want to use. So it made sense to combine these functions into a super search box front and center on the library homepage. Now super search is just a search box, but it gives clients the opportunity to search the library catalog through Primo, the library website using Funnelback, or to launch a database directly from a quick launch menu. 
The Quick Lodge menu uses the JSON file to show relevant database results. You can find a database using its catalog title or a variant title. For example, in the image on the screen, I am searching for the database Passport by typing in its alternative name, Euromonitor. Next on the slide is the resource link component. This component is used to list single resources in the website, either pulling the information dynamically from Alma for databases or being added manually if the item is not a database. Resource links will use the JSON file to validate and show if there is an outage or if registration is required. A link to a help guide will also show if it's available in the JSON. The final example on the screen is the resource list component. This component use, is used to group resources together and pull several resources dynamically from Alma at once. The resource list can group databases alphabetically or by subject. The key benefit from having these components pulling information from the Alma JSON file is that for a database record, they only need to be added and then kept up to date in Alma. Our discovery librarian who looks after these metadata records needs to only click a button to update the JSON and then these changes are reflected wherever the database is listed on our website. This saves valuable staff time in the library, but also ensures a more accurate experience for our clients who are less likely to run into broken links when accessing their essential resources. We have also used LibCal APIs extensively to integrate in the new website. LibCal is heavily used in Australia with close to 90% of Australian university libraries utilizing its functionality according to the QLOC survey from 2023. We created AEM components that interact with LibCal in a variety of ways. The first on the screen is the events component, which dynamically displays LibCal events. This leans heavily on the categories function of the LibCal to pull different events depending on where they have been added in the website. For example, on our referencing pages, it will only show referencing training events. It will automatically update when events pass or are added and disappears when there are no events scheduled that match the category specified. The next components are for opening hours. Opening hours have always been difficult for our libraries with 15, 15 different sites that have different opening hours throughout the year. And depending on if you are a staff or student or member of the general public, keeping this up to date and then being able to communicate the hours in a way that are easy for a user to understand is difficult. Using the LibCal API and our AEM components from the homepage, a user can select if they are a staff or student or from the general public and their preferred location. This information is cached for future visits to the website. The selection of staff, students or general public is then remembered as they move throughout the website. For example, on our visit page, where the daily opening hours are showed on each location's card. Going into a location, you can view a more fine grain opening hours for the week or for a date projected in the future. No two content redevelopment projects will be the same. Almost every factor can vary based on your organization's circumstances and your approach should vary with them. But this is a very high level view at the steps that we took broken down into three major phases. Firstly, we needed to assess what content we had and what the issues were, figure out how we could solve them and then ensure that measures were put into place to maintain the standard that we set. The first step to this was producing an accurate assessment of the content on the current website. Ben discussed earlier some of the measures that we took to conduct this research, so I won't focus heavily on this, but I do want to make note of the extensive efforts that the team made to ensure that we were actively listening to our client base. Continued engagement with library stakeholders was vital to the project. The University of Sydney has over 70,000 students and more than 6,000 academic staff. Our librarians are engaging with them every day. This meant that input from staff played a significant role in shaping the strategy and content outputs of the project. 
To keep it high level, we basically found that we were really, really good at finding information, less adept at keeping this information updated and organised, and we were not so great at removing information. And for our overarching goal, we wanted to make it easier for clients to find the information that is helpful to them. Next, onto the actual content refresh and the steps involved in our approach. Firstly, the training of staff involved in the rewrite. These staff were then engaged to assess and map existing content in their service areas. The structure and ownership of the IA was informed by an immense amount of research exercises undertaken by our UX specialists and through significant consultation with service owners in the library. When it came to authoring new content, we chose to keep it old fashioned, eschewing any AI helpers or external authoring services and instead choosing to empower our library staff. These pitches are the result of a workshop conducted with staff who would author content. Firstly, they were asked about our current content and later in the same workshop asked what words they would like to be associated with our content. Ongoing training and workshops not only equip staff with the knowledge and tools they needed to deliver quality outputs, but also contributed to a collaboratively created and shared vision. This meant that even with a crowdsourced approach to our content creation, the overarching voice would be consistent. This was further assisted by engaging with a copy editor through which every single piece of content flowed before being uploaded onto the website. Our new content was often born directly out of findings from our user research. For example, the creation of a section of the website specifically targeted to new students, which provides answers to the most common queries received by frontline staff. All of this content was revised for clarity and accuracy. A direct link to the section features prominently on the homepage during the beginning of semesters, and academics were encouraged to include mention in their introductory resources. A significant theme that arose in consultation was issues around ease of finding information and information overload, coupled with findings about what types of information clients were most likely to be seeking from a visit to our site. Landing pages were designed with user pathways in mind and content was written to serve specific use cases. Shown here are two sections of the support landing page, which immediately and efficiently present self-help content to our users. So let's look at where we're at today. We're now preparing to close out the redevelopment with an eye to maintaining all of the hard work we have done to overhaul our content. In keeping with the consultative nature of the rest of the project, we're collaborating closely with staff to finalise our editing workflows and content governance with an emphasis on functionality and sustainability. By engaging staff throughout the redevelopment, we have engendered significant buy-in around the quality and usability of content on the site. As the website continues to grow and adapt to the evolving needs of our clients, clearly defining responsibilities will prevent any backslides and ensure we remain aligned with our shared goals. Jen's now going to take us out of the presentation by highlighting one of the major changes we made to the site, the removal of LibGuides, and she'll also let you know how to get in contact with us if you want any more information. We had extensive subject guides built on the LibGuides platform by Springshare. In fact, the guides made up 52% of the entire website with 860 individual pages, and a lot of the information was duplicated. Deciding to move away from the guides was not because the content itself was back. In fact, many of the guides did a great job of capturing the vast amount of sources available for particular topics. Nor was it anything to do with the LibGuide platform itself. The decision was based on insights from UX research that students are experiencing mass information overload. So we need to offer a more curated list of resources when students are getting started rather than an extensive list. Additionally, the size of the guides and the unregulated creation and updating of these guides meant that it was holistically a huge task to keep these up to date. Finally, at times, the guides were used in place of teaching information literacy skills. However, most guides were not pedagogically aligned 
So apart from giving an extensive list of resources, students didn't gain any skills from using the guides. Our library staff have done extensive work to build a tiered services model to deliver tailored training to university students, often in line with their assessments and delivered within the university's learning management system. The newly curated resources by subject pages complement this work. The new pages are aligned with the university structure. As you can see on the screen, they have an overview page which documents some of the top resources for the whole faculty and then tabs to go into more five grade resources per school. They heavily utilise the resource link component so that database information can be updated directly from Alma. They also include support information or courses that relate to the subject area so that students can build their knowledge or access relevant library services while using resources for their subject. Affecting this type of change was not a quick or easy process. Having a research-backed vision, knowledgeable staff to create that vision, and then effective communication about the change was essential. There is so much more about this project that we'd love to share, but we need to wrap it up for today. We are happy to be contacted if you have inquiries. The best contact is Maddie, who you can email at madeline.wilson at sydney.edu.au. Thank you.